Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. As we wrap up October 2023, we're taking you back 188 years ago to October 1835, the early days of the Texas Revolution, a pivotal point in the burgeoning movement against the centralization of power in Mexico City. Today, we explore the battles of October 1835, how the front line of revolution moved from Gonzales to modern day San Antonio, and how these fights set the stage for what came next at the Alamo. I'm your host, Emily Bauckham. We're once again joined by Ernesto Rodriguez, the Alamo senior curator, historian, and lecturer. Ernesto, thank you for coming back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. October 2nd, 1835, the Texas Revolution begins when shots are fired in the town of Gonzales. What was happening in the background in the days and weeks leading up to this? So one of the things that has started to happen in Mexico is that they've switched from being a federal republic under a constitution to becoming a centralist regime where all authority is centralized in Mexico City. And so with that starting up, people in Mexico start to revolt and the revolt spreads north. During this period of transition, on March 31st, 1835, the Mexican government passes a decree, which is basically known as the Militia Reduction Act. That act limits the militia sizes to one person for every 500 inhabitants, and it also calls for all artillery to be sent to a central location. The central location in Texas is the Alamo. So things are starting to be a little more violent in the sense of you're starting to lose your means of protection. Now, the Mexican government starts sending troops north, and any time troops are moved into an area, people become suspicious. Now, Martin Perfecto de Cos is sent with the Morelos Battalion into Texas to start to reinforce the forts along the border and also to just try to gain control. That will start more of an activation in the committees of safety. Now, these committees of safety were little groups of men, sort of like the Minutemen, that were ready to go and defend their towns. So these committees start to form, and they start getting activated. Now, here at the Alamo, Colonel Ogartachea sends out 100 dragoons, or mounted infantry, to go and retrieve a cannon from the town of Gonzales. They leave in late September, and they start their march towards the town. When they arrive at the town, they are greeted with all the ferries to cross the Guadalupe River on the opposite side and a group of 18 men waiting for them. Now, Castaneda yells across the river that he's there for the cannon and they respond, we cannot give it to you, the mayor's not here, come back later. So he moves his troops. He still has 100 dragoons, he's receiving orders daily and the orders are telling him Keep the cavalry intact and do not fight unless you are provoked, but mainly do not fight. Now, when he's called back to the banks of the Guadalupe River, there's 180 men now. He still has 100, and the discussion starts again. I'm here for the cannon. The response this time is well, an individual will yell out, if you want it, come and take it, at which point, both sides stop the negotiations and the Mexican army begin, begins to look for a way to ford the river. It is a foggy night into the, into the day. Both sides are now on the same side of the river because the Texians crossed over and they will meet, a, we meet nearby. When the fog clears, a shot is fired. Castaneda steps out into the middle of the battlefield and yells out, why are you shooting at us? And they, they respond, because you are a centralist, we are federalist, and we're here to defend the Constitution of 1824. His response is, I am not a centralist, I am a Republican, but I am a soldier and must do my duty as I have been ordered. He had just been ordered to return home, at which point he turns his men around and they start marching. The men at Gonzalez begin to cheer, and they start making plans for taking San Antonio. At this point in San Antonio, who has control of the Alamo? The Mexican army is in charge of the Alamo. And so they have started working on it to fortify it, to make the fortifications in the town as well, because if you control the roads, you control any, any supplies and any type of messages coming through. And so you want to control the town. 
the town of San Antonio sits on the major roads that come into Texas. And so the, the Mexican army is fortifying the plazas as they fortify the Alamo itself. October 9th and 10th, there's the Goliad campaign, a reaction to the arrival of General Coase and his men. Yes. Uh, so a group of men start to gather at several, several places, and they begin their march to Goliad. Now, they march in the middle of the night. They take, they basically reach the reach Goliad in the middle of the night, and they attack. It's a surprise attack. Within about 30 minutes, the battle is over. Some men do escape to warn the Mexican army of what has happened, and the troops at Refugio begin marching towards um, Pipantitlan. And so this is the first time that the Texans will now capture a, a fort, and they will basically stay there through the duration. But... Um, this is one of those events that prompts the Mexican army to really begin prepping for war because now they've lost a stronghold. There's a famous painting in the Alamo collection depicting Benjamin Milam rallying volunteers to fight. Listeners in San Antonio may be familiar with Milam Park, named after him. Who was he? So Benjamin Rush Milam was born in Kentucky, and um, he participated in the War of 1812, he participated in the independence movement for Mexico. He's captured at one point, imprisoned. He has um, land grants in Texas, so he's a well-known Texan. Now, right before he gets here, he's just escaped from prison, and he arrives on the scene, and uh, he participates in the events at Goliad and then makes his way to San Antonio. The painting is basically him calling for volunteers in which he is known to have said, who will go with old Ben Milam into San Antonio? And he leads the attack in December. Benjamin Milam wrote on October 10th, 1835, I assisted Texas to gain her independence. The events of this night have compensated me for all my losses and all my sufferings. Yes, he assisted Texas to gain its independence because this movement had started. There was a group of men that decided that they wanted Texas independence and they do draft a document there at Goliad. And so as a person that has been a, has adopted Texas as his new home, he, is a, he was an individual that had fought in many wars and he knew the importance of independence from an oppressive regime. A few days after Milam writes those words, October 13th, 1835, the New Orleans Grays are organized. Who were they? So the New Orleans Grays was a group of men that were organized at Banksy Arcade in New Orleans with the sole purpose of coming and helping in the, in the oncoming war. And so these men were known as the Grays because they were wearing gray clothing, mainly a fatigue jacket, if it was available, um, that was made after the pattern of the U.S. Army. But these men all started gathering, and they began their march in two ways. One group gets on a boat and comes to the coast of Texas, the other one marches over land. And these men will come in and take part in the Battle of Bear in December. The group that is then left over, part of them go back to Goliad, and that group will become known as the San Antonio Grays. But these men are just regular people, farmers, ranchers, doctors, lawyers. They were people that had taken up the cause for Texas independence. The next day, October 14th, 1835, Samuel Maverick sees Haley's Comet. There's a revolution happening, but in some ways, life goes on. Yes, for many people, you know, this war hasn't gotten to them. And so you have to think about, there's group fighting, there's a group that's far away, there's a group that is preparing to fight, but this is what happens in most situations, even when in modern warfare, while some of our men and women in the armed forces are getting ready to go. Life goes on. People still continue to do their daily routines as a way of keeping things normal. And so you also need to be able to function in a different manner because you are still having to produce whatever is needed for the war effort. And if you stop everything, you cannot help in the cause. Sometimes you got to look up at the sky. Yes, you do. At this time, we're starting to see hundreds of volunteers, including James Bowie, James Fan, and Juan Seguin, arriving on the outskirts of town. They were under the command of Stephen F. Austin. Now, those are all big names we know today. What are their stories? Well, their stories are very interesting because if you think about Juan Seguin, he was born in Texas. 
He is a native Tejano, as we call him today, but he's a native. This is his land. He is fighting for a cause for his home that he was born in. If he wins the revolution and independence is declared and achieved, then he can peacefully stay at home. But if you choose the wrong side and lose and survive, he has no home. Unlike some of the other volunteers that can go back home to the United States, the Tejano population doesn't have that choice. Others like James Bowie had come into Texas 1831, and um, he had come to San Antonio, had married into a very influential family, and he had started a new, a new life. Unfortunately, 1833, um, he loses his wife and most of his in-laws. And so he is now a widower living in a, in a different land. And so his story is a little different. People know who he is. He has made a name for himself. And when the war is about to break out, he volunteers and he goes and serves in different roles. One of the roles will bring him back to San Antonio and um, he will be here after December when Texans gain control of the Alamo, and he will be sent to do a reconnaissance work, basically, whether or not the Alamo and the fortifications in town should be spared. And he will co-sign a letter that they would prefer to die in these ditches and give them up to the enemy. The other gentleman, James Fannin, had come to Texas also to, in a way to make money, and he wanted to have a position of power. And when he is finally given that position of power, um, he starts to think twice about his choices. He will be in command of the, of the garrison at Goliad in 30, 1836, and his, he and his men will perish in the Goliad massacre. October 28, 1835, on a foggy morning, there's a skirmish at Mission Concepcion. Yes, so the Mexican army, so Ugartachea, sends out troops. And the plan is to catch these uh, rebels off guard. And so when they approach Mission Concepcion, they start to fire on the Texians, who happen to be in a tree line. And so this tree line will be a really important factor in the battle because it gives them cover. The Texans fire back, and in the end, the Mexican army loses an artillery piece, loses several men, and is forced to withdraw. The two commanders there, James Bowie and James Walker Fannin. So how did all this set the stage for the next couple of months at the Alamo? So it starts to set the stage even more because men are starting to come to the aid of the Texan cause. There's been calls for help that have been sent out. And so men are starting to arrive. They're starting to surround the entire town. And as this is happening, these men that are enlisting, they're enlisting for three, six, nine, 12 months. Many of the men that had started out early are now getting ready to leave because it's now December. They have to tend to their farms, tend to their families. And it's at this point that Benjamin Rush Milam steps into the picture again, and that's when he calls for volunteers forcing the attack. But in between, you have a lot of other events that are occurring. One of them will happen next month in November, known as a grass fight. And so San Antonio is, is living up to its name as a disputed area because now you've got two groups on the verge of an explosion at the Alamo. That's very powerful. Are there any artifacts on display at the Alamo from October of 1835, either related to these battles or related to the people? We have uh, on display, we have items from the aftermath of Gonzalez, unfortunately. There are a few artifacts that will connect the dots to that, but they're all mainly post-35. We learned in a previous episode of the podcast, you can still see the Come and Take It cannon somewhere in San Antonio. Yes, you can. I'm actually sitting in an office that overlooks the park that's right across from where the, cannon, the old cannon can be seen. That cannon was uh, melted down. It was a six-pound bronze cannon, and it was melted down after Mary Maverick donated it to St. Mark's Episcopal Church. It became a bell. And so if you ever come to San Antonio and you walk right next to what is Travis Park, that's where the church is, look at the back and you will see there's a bell in the bell tower that has a star and it says Texas on it. What would you say are the lessons, the takeaways of October 1835? The lessons that we start to learn is how, how fragile our freedoms really are and how easily someone can take them. And so when you think about what prompts these, 
this revolution, it's an event that happens hundreds of miles away, but it comes to change the way people live and how they survive. And so when you look at the Texas Revolution and you see what happens, it's a mirrored event similar to that of the American Revolution in 1776. So it tells us all history is connected and we must learn from it to not repeat it. Ernesto Rodriguez, thank you so much for joining us. Be sure to check out the podcast notes. We've linked to the painting in the Alamo collection of Benjamin Milam rallying volunteers. That page also has much more information on the early days of the Texas Revolution. And we've also linked to a video with more on the life and legacy of Juan Seguin. You've been listening to Stories Bigger Than Texas, the Alamo podcast. Mm-hmm.